Good morning, everybody. Good evening and good afternoon, depending where you're joining. So thank you to Stomp, first of all. Um, my name is Brian Anthony. I'm the Associate Director of MIT Nano, and here to share with you a, a lot about ambient sensing or immersed in ambient sensing. And this is predominantly work uh, that I want to celebrate. Uh, that's the doctoral work of, of Dr. Katie Hum, who just recently completed her thesis um, in this area of ambient sensing. So when you were watching Stomp, in addition to probably wanting to dance, you heard a lot, you saw a lot. You saw people moving and sweating, making noise. So now that we've trained you a little bit to maybe associate um, those noises with what you're seeing, um, let's frame the, the, the challenge. Yeah. How do we embed sensors? How do we embed systems that can perceive as something into our ambient environment to make sense of what's happening in the environment? You see the world, you see the environment, you see things, you hear things. So we have ambient sensors that allow us to understand and to perceive the world around us. How do we, how do we use those tools? So now that you've been trained, um, what have you learned? So I'm gonna play a series of videos where first we're going to just hear something. And those some things are recorded inside of the, the immersion lab here at MIT Nano. And we have sensors that are making measurements on the floor. We have sensors that are recording the, the sound that's happening in the world. We have cameras that are watching what's going on. And we're going to layer, layer by layer, different experiences. So action number one. So you'll just hear something. So in addition to being recording of sound of activity, what you're looking at now is points that are being tracked on the left of an individual performing this task. You see dots that are being tracked, you see their arms moving. You can tell that those are arms. You should be able to tell that's a torso. On the right, you were seeing acceleration signals from the floor. We also construct that data. We take that data and we construct an avatar of simulation of what the person is doing. And on the right, we see at the top, we see EMG sensors, the, the muscle activity. In the middle, we see accelerometers on the person. Uh, and the bottom, we see gyroscopes. And over here, we see force sensitive resistors of so things that are in the shoe measuring the amount of force that's being applied by the feet onto the floor. So what was your guess of the activity? Did it look something like this? Dr. Nathan Murray uh, bouncing the basketball on a floor in the immersion lab. You can see around him the camera, the little green lights that are tracking his motion. And the, on the floor, in the corner of the, the wooden floor, there are accelerometers that are measuring the signals that are being trans transmitted, both as he moves and as the, the ball bounces. And then on him are sensors that are measuring his electrical signals from his muscle, from uh, the, the force that he is applying uh, through his feet uh, to the floor. Question number two, and there will be an exam at the end. Question number two, take a listen. Now being tracked and feeling the vibration on the foot. And then finally, the avatar recreation from the tracking of those motion points and the physiological measurements, the EMG, the muscle activation at the top, acceleration as the limbs are moving, gyroscopes as the limbs are moving, and the force between the floor and the feet as measured by the shoes, as opposed to the acceleration sensors that are on the floor itself. So this one, at this point, you should have guessed that it looked something like this. Again, thanks to Bernice for 
putting on the shirt and doing a lot of exercises. Okay, so one more. Take a listen. Not a woodpecker. Couple different activities there. So now let's see what they were doing. The motion points on the right, sorry, on the left. And again, the acceleration sensors that are on the corners of the floor, measuring the vibrations, acceleration that's impacted from beneath walking or jumping uh, to the signals that are received at the corner of the floor. You see now it seems to be he's walking around. So we'll skip to the avatar here. Physiological signal, muscle, acceleration, gyroscope, four sensors, the sensors that are on him. So we have this full litany of sensors that are from the ambient environment and from what's being attached to Praneet. You have really good ears. Maybe you get the motion. And we'll hold the most difficult one uh, to the end as we go through the, the next uh, set of slides. Okay, so all of these experiments or sort of test questions for you uh, were done inside of the place that I'm broadcasting from now, the MIT Nano Immersion Lab. The Immersion Lab is a central facility here at MIT dedicated to exposing to the community, on campus, off campus community, immersive technologies that includes AR and VR, that includes sensors embedded in the ambient environment, that includes how we interact with data with an augmented or virtual reality headset in more natural ways to manipulate the world. Open to the MIT community to explore the research and educational questions uh, and to the broader community to do the same. We have an abundance of instrumentation where we make the human the specimen, the human inside the Immersion Lab. It's an integrated instrument for humans where we can track how they move around. We can measure aspects of their physiology, the force they're applying on the floor, the, the electrical signals coming from their muscle, the rate with which they're breathing. We have a strong collaboration as well with the Center for Clinical and Translational Research uh, over in building E25 here at MIT, who very much supports human subjects research on campus. So broadly, what I wanna talk about today is how do we use these technologies in the context of deploying or potentially deploying some really valuable ambient sensing techniques. And what I mean by ambient sensing is what the environment measuring in the environment and, and you are, you're perceiving the world. You, know, you, you, you perceive through sight, optical techniques, you perceive through sound, how you hear. Um, you don't have a radar sensor, um, but radar sensors of the sort that you can get in radar guns uh, are uh, sort of easily and low costly deployed. Uh, touch, we interact with the world. So how do we take those sensors, those that ability to measure the, the world and say something about the people in the world? Now we care, for example, when we care about people and health and wellness of an individual, we know that the standard vitals, what's your temperature, what's your heart rate, what's your respiration rate? And there are, techniques that allow us to extract those measurements from sensors that are not attached to the body, but that are non-contact with the body. And we're just perceiving or listening to the body. Here's a starting example. Uh, this is a, a thermal camera recording of uh, Dr. Sean Zhang wearing a mask uh, during the pandemic living, if you will. The thermal camera, I'm sure you've, you've had some experiences or maybe seen videos like this. The, the camera itself operates in the IR and the different colors correspond to the temperature. And so you can figure out the temperature near the eye, which is the nominal place to measure it. But also interestingly, with wearing the mask, you see the temperature fluctuation of the mask. And so in, indirectly in here is as well, a measure of respiration, right? So this is one example of, I'm not wearing something, I'm not wearing the sensor, but a non-contact, a, a camera in the environment could 
measure aspects of my vital signs, in this case, temperature. Now, a little bit more complex, um, and I would also sort of celebrate and point out work uh, by, here at MIT by Dean Exitabi, who's looking at, at radio signals, and in particular, Wi-Fi. Uh, but here, in a, in a more narrow aspect, your body is a mirror at certain wavelengths to, to radar energy. If you, if you shine, if you bounce a radar pulse off of me, um, it will, it will radar bounces off of me and back to the, the transmitter. Now, since I'm a mirror, um, if I, instead of a pulse of radar, I sort of um, emit a continuous wave, a, a continuous wave radar signal, as my body moves, as I breathe, um, and as my heart beats, it modulates me as a mirror, it changes the mirror. And I would pick up that vibration on the energy that bounces off of me and back to a receiver. And if I do a simple thing, like take the Fourier transform that receives signal, I will have peaks that correspond, oscillatory peaks that correspond to both my breathing rate and my heart rate. And I can use that simple concept now with a, a series of processing steps, the radar sensor embedded in the wall or in the ceiling and, and monitor the, in a non-contact and an ambient way, the heart rate and respiration of, of multiple people in a room as another example of what it may mean to be an ambient sensor. Now, in two ways, I want to expand this thinking a little bit. When we think about the standard vitals, heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, maybe pulse ox, blood oxygenation, those are, are very valuable measurements that can be easily acquired uh, in the hospital or in the clinic when you go see the doctor. Some of them can be acquired uh, by the, the patient, the subject in their own home. Um, motion as an as a, as a indicator of your health intuitively you know it's very valuable or, or so you, you and I mean walk you through that if you get up in the morning and you've twisted your back or you have the flu you're not feeling well how you walk how you move around is very indicative of your general overall sense of wellness and well-being now beyond that if you start to look at neurocognitive diseases like Parkinson's disease or sort of impairments of general of, of general cognitive decline how you move your balance whether you can stand on one foot I stand on one foot with your eyes closed. I can do it for a little bit. But balance and gait broadly are indicators of your health. Indicators of, of neurocognitive decline can predict, if you're walking differently, can predict the likeliness of falls. And you just know it. If you're not comfortable, you're not walking well. So how do we, how do we use motion? How does a doctor use motion? Well, it's actually reasonably hard right, to, to understand motion clinically and very quantitatively, you're going to go into some clinical environment and in that clinical environment, they're going to watch you and they're going to be um, interested in things like your step time. What is the symmetry of your step time? Right to left, left to right, are you balanced in how you move? Gait variability has, is, a, is a biomarker, is a, a, a measure of health that's used for Parkinson's disease. Uh, Huntington's disease and, and looking at so the both progression uh, and, and change in cognitive function. Another very important clinical parameter is the, the, your, how hard you're interacting with the floor. If I'm walking and I have one of my feet is very heavy, I slap it down. Or if I'm um, not symmetric in how I'm walking, the, the amount of force that I'm applying in, in that temporal trajectory of, of whether I'm slamming down on my heel first or toe first, but overall, this, this measure of the interaction between you and the floor and how hard you're hitting and how you're walking. This is the timing of steps. So these two parameters, the step time and vertical ground reaction force are, are used, can be used as general measures of health um, and sort of are, are indicative of, of progression of, or the presence of different neurocognitive diseases. But if I wanna use these measures, I need to come to the immersion lab or we're not doctors here, med MDs, uh, we would need to go to a biomechanics lab. We would need to go do a gait study where we're hopping on a treadmill. We're using tools like this where we can track the motion of somebody. We, we wire them up. And it's an episodic activity. You come to the lab, you go to the doctor, and you can get measurements that for that day that I'm at the lab, and maybe or at the doctor, I go there once a year, once a month, but very relatively infrequently, I can get some high quality precision measurements. Indeed. And I can, you know, in the case of the, the immersion lab, we don't just study gait. Uh, if you have been following this, this channel, uh, you've seen in the past how we've used motion capture and tools to understand how people move for the study of baseball, right? But it's a set of tools, complex, rich, and phenomenal tools that give us very precise, high-quality data in rarefied environments, which are very important 
but it's not an ambient sensor that I can easily deploy, say, into the workplace or into the home. So gate monitoring in practice. Right? You'll go to see the doctor. They'll put you on force place. They'll put you on treadmills. They'll observe you. They'll take measurements. Now, we certainly can do uh, measurements of steps or number of steps using wearable devices, but these monitoring systems don't really allow us to actually have reached the tipping point where motion is like another vital sign where it can be acquired continuously. The problem with motion, problem with any vital sign, frankly, is that when you, if you're just measuring it at the doctor's office, you have those episodic measurements. There's a lot of value in all of this sort of the thinking around how we use wellness devices like wearables and um, sort of garments and Fitbits and Apple watches, we can get maybe less precise measurements, but continuously in the context of daily living, we can imagine ways of doing that for the standard vitals, but, but motion, other than just how many steps have you taken, aren't accessible via the technologies that are worn. And if you want more frequent measurements, you're gonna have to go to the doctors a lot, but only to the doctor that has the biomechanics facility. Now, presumably, I think from the um, seeing stomp at the very beginning, and maybe sort of as the prelude, seeing the, the acceleration signals uh, from the floor. So what you were actually looking at when we saw not stomp, but when you were seeing Praneet dance and move around, the forest sensors were on his body, but we have accelerometers in the corner of the floor. In the floor, you can see one of the floors uh, you can see behind me. Um, and if I'm walking in the floor, you know, stomp, I was making noise. I won't claim to be as good of a dancer as, uh, or nor as good as with a broom as they were in stomp. But if I'm moving around on this floor and making noise, I can hear the noise, but the floor is feeling what I'm doing. So I can embed either place onto the floor sensors in the corner or around the periphery that will receive the energy that I am imparting into the floor as I walk. And the reason this is interesting is that you're in the home environment very frequently. If I can, in a very natural way, measure aspects of your motion, of your gait, without you having to go to the doctor, without you having to remember to wear a, a sensor, but instead to have just the natural environment be able to observe you. How do we use the vibrations from the floor, from how you walk, to actually get to some biomarkers, some, some parameters of interest that can say something about your overall general health? So we wanna move from the clinic where you have to go to the clinic and see the doctor to being able to acquire data on your gait, on your motion in the home, in the context of daily living. Okay, so a little bit on some of the first experiments. So again, this is work that actually started uh, during the pandemic. And, and I, I certainly wanna celebrate uh, Katie's work in, in actually turning her, her apartment uh, partially into a lab. Uh, some of the very first data that she collected was deploying a small number, in this case, three accelerometers in the corner of her room where she has her bed and her desk and dresser. And she can walk around. So here you'll see the, the black things in the corner are accelerometers she mounts to the floor. The red taping is a sort of a coordinate system. So she can, uh, in looking at this video, understand where she is, a course measurement of where she is uh, as ground truth measurement. Um, but here's the experimental setup. Walk around and we can interact with the floor if I'm quiet, you may be able to hear Katie walking. You hear that, right? And those signals that we hear are also transmitted through the floor and the accelerometers hear them, but as through the floor. Now, if you look at what a individual as I walk, step, 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 depending on what you're wearing on your foot, um, whether it's a barefoot strike or a shoe strike, the temporal profile, where these plots are amplitude of the uh, energy being received from the accelerometer versus time. And it looks different depending on what you're wearing on your foot. If I walk away from a sensor, uh, if I look at just the signal, the accelerometer at, from in one corner, as I walk away from that corner, uh, how long it takes to get the signal through the floor from where I step to the sensor takes time. Um, and you can see the amplitude decreasing as I get further and further away. Right, so that's the information that's received from a series of footsteps from one sensor. Now in the home, if you are, you know, you're not walking a mile uh, straight away in your home. You don't have a, a set of force plates or a dedicated space where you're doing a gate study. Um, but you probably are sitting down for a little bit. You walk across your room for a little bit. You sit down, you, 
you take steps again, a few steps here, a few steps there. Now, if you know your predominant foot, in general, you're probably going to step when you first start walking, you're probably going to lead off with your prominent foot, um, but not always. And so if I'm looking at somebody that's just walking in their natural environment, and I plot here the, the magnitude of the energy received at a particular accelerometer uh, over time, and I, I say, oh, well, what, what's happened here is somebody has walked, they took four steps, they stood still, they took another four steps, they stood still, they took another four steps, they stood still, and they took another four steps. But I don't know, is it left, right, right, left? Um, but I see some signals. I see some information. So th there's a lot of power just in this little bit of information. So let's layer it on. So if I just say, well, okay, I know if I know that it's one person, um, I can just do some simple processing where let's just look at the, the distances, the time distances between each individual step or each individual pulse or spike that corresponds to a step. And if I acquire a bunch of that data so from these episodic walking events as I walk around my house, and I plot the distribution of those step times, and I compare what those step times look like if you are balanced in how you walk to whether you have a limp or an imbalance in how you walk, just the statistics acquired in the context of daily living and in a living space where you're just once in a while taking four steps here, five steps there, looking at the, 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 the time separation between subsequent steps, plotting that, I can see that, well, if I have a very uniform balanced gait, in general, my left, right, right, left should be balanced and uniform. And I expect a nice single mode in the statistics of my step times, just seen here in, in, in this blue plot. As I become a little bit more imbalanced or asymmetric, if it's a, a fast step to the right and a slow step to the left, and I collect that data, not knowing in any measurement, whether it's left, right, or right, left, but I plot the statistics, I start to see that the, the distribution of my times starts to become bimodal and revealing the asymmetry in your step time, right, left, left, right. So another example where, well, here's at least sort of one potential insight where we can just use some simple, easy to deploy sensors to measure the stride time as, as revealed by the timing between energy pulses as, as received by an accelerometer with a, a measure of the bimodality, how many bumps there are in the histogram. If it's one bump, we expect it to be no limp. If it's multiple bumps, two bumps, there's some indication that your left right is different than your right left or vice versa. Okay, but step time is but one thing. Now, we want to collect that richer set of things. And the, the, the first richer set of thing that we'll sort of highlight is the, we want to know not just the timing, but we would like to know, well, how hard am I pressing? How hard am I stepping? Now to first order, you know, if, if I, 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 I can hear it, I can tap lightly or I can tap hard. And so there's in the accelerometer data, you would expect a small pulse versus a big pulse. And so that's sort of the intuition, but we want to develop a robust technique to use the, the limited redundancy that we have, the multiple accelerometers on the floor to learn from that data, how we can take this complex data that is a function of where you are in the floor, um, the properties of the floor, whether it be a wooden floor or a concrete floor or linoleum or, or tile. And I wanna be able to learn how to make sense of all this complex data, building on the intuition that indeed, generally, if I'm closer, I press harder or stomp harder, stomp harder these, this, the, the energy is gonna go up for any one accelerometer. But how do, I, how do I combine these in a very complex way where I don't know the properties of the floor and, and, I, and I wanna deploy this into a, 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 somebody's home? So the, the mechanism to develop the, the machine learning techniques um, that, were, that Katie advanced uh, benefited from the immersion lab. So we, we, the ground truth data, we mount an inertial measurement unit onto the leg. We mount uh, reflective markers on the body in order to track how somebody's moving. We put four sensitive resistors in the sole of the foot. And then as well, yes, we have the accelerometers in the floor. Now, the, 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 the raw and training data is very similar to some of the things you saw in the, the first examples at the very beginning. As we walk around the floor, 
performing different sort of modifications to somebody's gait, as you'll see, by making them carry a weight or in some way introducing an asymmetry or changing how they walk. We can collect the accelerometer data, which when you imagine this being deployed into an ambient environment uh, is the only sensor that we're going to have. But as part of our training activity and part of learning how to interpret that acceleration data, we have all the, the richness of what we have here in the immersion lab. We have the uh, four sensitive resistors in the shoe. We have accelerometers that are actually measuring the tibial acceleration as the person walks and as the person stomps. And we have where they are in space, where, where are they located in the room uh, from the, the motion capture and as well, how they're moving, the dynamics of how they're moving as well coming from that data. So we're going to use the worn sensors as the labeling to learn how to extract information about your ground reaction force just from the accelerometer data. So some of the experiments, just to understand the methodology, um, Katie um, enrolled a number of individuals and had them do different, in play, put in place different interventions. Have them do regular walking, putting a brace on their leg while they walk, making, putting uh, something in their shoe as they walk, or having them hold a weight. So it's a way to induce symmetry is another way to uh, do some controlled experiments. The putting these technologies together, you know, again, the, the, the general framing is we, we're trying to get the, the, a real measure of the ground reaction force, or, or more precisely, we're trying to get a measure of the, the tibial acceleration. So we have the ground truth tibial acceleration, and we use that as our, as our labels to learn how to map accelerometer data to what the tibial acceleration actually is. The overall set of work um, that, that Katie developed um, is taking all this accelerometer data, uh, accelerometers mounted as ambient sensors in the floor, processing it to extract vibration signatures and features that from the data, um, the arrival times, the amount of energy, the frequency content, training a, a, um, two different types of learning methodologies uh, to first determine the step times. That's looking at the histogram and the distribution of the, of the histograms. And then using a, a, a classifier and a regressor in combination to localize footsteps and to estimate and from the raw accelerometry data, the ground truth of the tibial acceleration from a worn sensor. So as a framework, we can collect rich data in this phenomenal environment to learn how to use low cost sensors deployed ambiently. The, the exciting results that are, are in her thesis um, and are, um, have been submitted for, and are under review for publication um, is now comparing the, the ground reaction force and more precisely the, the tibial acceleration, they're directly correlated um, with what the real values are as measured by the Warren sensor and what the machine learning algorithm predicts. So let, let me try to explain this plot a little bit and also highlight an interesting point. So as I, as I walk around the space, I take a step, a step, a step. And at every time I take a step, each accelerometer receives a, a pulse of energy. From that pulse of energy, we extract features, the frequency content, the amplitude, the timing. And that is the information that goes into the, the classifier, or the, the regressor, that predicts from that received accelerometry data, predicts what the actual tibial acceleration is here for which we know the ground truth because we actually have an accelerometer on the body itself. What you'll notice is if we focus first on the left, any one, these, the red and blue points um, are the estimation of the tibial acceleration or, or correlated the, the ground reaction force for every single footstep. And we see that when we're estimating at any single footstep, um, we have a lot of error, meaning the, the real tibial acceleration here is 1.5. The predicted was something greater than 2.5. or The real was a little bit less than 2.5, and we predicted 1.5. So any one measurement is not all that great. But if we acquire here uh, on the handful of, of 50 to 60 measurements, as they're walking throughout the day, the average of the predicted and the average of the real agree quite nicely. Right? So even though the, at any one individual footstep, our estimation is quite poor. When averaged over the multiple measurements, as they walk through the space, 
we're able to very robustly extract measure that just from the accelerometer data that correlates quite strongly with what the ground truth labeling is with the accelerometer worn on the body. And we have that here for both regular walking and a, a, an intervention where we introduced a weight um, holding it in the bot on the, uh, to, to, to introduce a, a, a heavier load on the left versus the right. Okay, so we have now a sort of a methodology to estimate robustly just from accelerometry data in a natural environment where the floor is not necessarily uniform, but we train on that floor to learn how to interpret. And from this single person walking data, and this is from one accelerometer trace, um, where we have multiple accelerometers, we can estimate these, these really interesting and powerful clinically relevant parameters. Now you should naturally be asking, well, I, I have a partner or I have children, or maybe I have a pet um, and there are multiple people walking around. So can these things be done um, when we have multiple people? Um, so far, yes, the answer to up to two is most definitively uh, active research to continue it beyond two. Um, the flow of the, you know, of the processing here is we, we start with the accelerometry data now of multiple people walking around. We, we do some processing and we work at the energy of, of over time of all this, of, of all these accelerometer traces. We can take an envelope of the, the, the energy content in there and plot that magnitude versus time. And we see things now that look like spikes that correspond to where the spikes in energy occurred from foot, individual footfalls of multiple people. But what we don't know is which person's footsteps are which. We can detect when there's, or when we, we can predict when there's a, a likely footstep, but we don't really know. So the, the additional piece that um, Katie really championed was as also figuring out using training data in the situation where we, where we know one person is walking around and another one person walking around, we can use that to develop a, a decision tree to help in the labeling, where we have now a situation where we have multiple people, two people walking around the room, we first have to learn from a decision tree or classify from a decision tree um, as a step belong to person A or person B. And once we do that, then we can go and go back to our, our other techniques for estimating stride time and the ground reaction force. So the results that Katie was able to achieve a 90% accuracy on the labeling uh, within 0.1 seconds of the actual time. Um, and that gives us the ability to say it's person one, person two uh, for their footsteps. And we see here the, 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 the circles, and the X's being both the, the measured and the detected for two different people. Uh, and you'll see there's a good agreement between the labeling um, and what the ground truth is and what the final labeling was coming from the, the binary decision tree. Putting that all together, uh, the success that Katie had with her work um, is sort of this pipeline of really thinking through how we can enable your home to be a tool to help measure and determine aspects of your gait, in particular stride time and ground reaction force, a series of, of, of conventional or classical signal processing techniques uh, to analyze the signals, uh, extracting features, learning from those features, how to extract the complex from the complex accelerometry data on the floor, what your step times are and what your ground reaction forces are and demonstrated quite successfully the ability to do that for both, uh, for multiple people. So how are we doing on time? So uh, in the interest of time, and we still we have some time. So that's sort of the, the first thing that I wanted to try to celebrate and highlight. One, one aspect of what it means to have an ambient sensor, and in this case, an ambient sensor that gives us something that is currently otherwise inaccessible, except if you go to a, a, a very pristine space that does research or does clinical practice to understand your gait, we think we can get some interesting things in the home. And ultimately, you know, how do we deploy a combination of radar sensors in the wall uh, or in the ceiling, sensors in the floor to get a full uh, sort of full view of, of the, the state of health of, of the occupants. Now, um, I wanna highlight before I give you the exam on, on the final motion activity, I do wanna uh, also highlight uh, and celebrate some of the work from Dr. Sean Zhang, uh, who's now a research scientist at MIT, uh, but for his doctoral work, um, he moved this technology called laser ultrasound, which I will also put into this sort of this framework of ambient sensing um, and being able to image from a distance an individual with ultrasound technology. So for 30 years, uh, there's been deep uh, utility and application 
of his, of, of his phenomenology called laser ultrasound in industry, where we use two lasers to measure defects or properties of a material, aluminum or silicon. The methodology is if I take a pulsed laser, a laser that is, is a pulse of light, pause, a pulse of light, pause, so not a continuous wave laser beam, but a pulsation of light. So I froze it in time. If I were able to do that, I would have a light pulse space, light pulse space. I can shine that onto a surface. If I shine that onto a surface, at, depending on the, the material and the wavelength of light, when that light pulse hits the material, it will be absorbed. And very rapidly and very small, not damaging the material, it'll create a thermal gradient and then a stress gradient that needs to, because forces aren't balanced, it needs to propagate away. And it propagates away as, as, it's, as an expansion of the material, very subtle. It propagates away as sound. So that was one light pulse. But now I'm going to keep tapping. Imagine I'm tapping the material with light pulses. Pulse, 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 pulse. I'm not touching it, but light is interacting with the material, expanding the material, sound propagates away. That sound now <clears throat> is the same sound that I could have generated had I had a transducer, a speaker put in contact, but the sound propagates through the medium, bounces off of reflections, comes back or propagates through the material. At some other location, either at the same place where I imparted the energy or at a distance away, if I have another laser, a continuous wave laser, um, serving as an interferometer, measuring the deflections or the vibrations of the surface, I can, in a non-contact way, ambient, non-contact way, detect the motion of the surface that is resulting from sound propagating through it. So in this way, I can use two lasers. One that's a pulse laser to generate sound, another one a continuous wave laser to detect sound. And that's been used for decades now in non-destructive testing. What Sean was able to do is using eye and skin safe lasers, actually translate that and demonstrate the first clinical, first, first in humans, an, um, completely non-contact, eye and skin safe <clears throat> laser ultrasound image. So we can imagine in the future, not yet, in the future, ambient sensors, eye and skin safe lasers, maybe not in the living room, uh, but, but in certainly the surgical suite or other sort of in, um, clinical environments, where I no longer need to take an ultrasound probe and put it into contact with the body to get an ultrasound image. Ultrasound being non-ionizing, fundamentally safe. It's not X-ray, it's not MR, but I need historically to put it into contact, but I can now have an extra arm for myself in the surgical suite where I'm not making contact. So the, the first set of data that he acquired uh, was demonstrating this on, on, tissue, on, on uh, animal tissue. Um, I'll, I'll skip over the, this slide. You know, the, this sort of gives the graphic of the two laser beams. One that's a pulsed laser beam that's hit, hitting the surface, generates sound that goes in, bounces off of things and comes back, same way that it does in a handheld ultrasound system. And then using a continuous wave laser to measure the vibrations, the mechanical vibrations. They're doing this all in a non-contact way. Um, if you then take these two laser beams and you scan them across the body, in this case, we're looking at one location, um, the, the green laser that you're seeing, the spot is actually just a guide laser. It's not the wavelength of light that's being used to ge either generate or detect the sound. Uh, but from the, the vibration signatures, sim similar to tapping on the floor with my foot, now tapping on the arm with light, that sound propagates into the body, bounces off of the, the muscle boundaries, bounces off of the bone boundaries, comes back to the surface of the skin where the interferometer is indeed detecting, in which that's what the plot is here, showing that detection of the vibration signatures at the, at the surface. If I then scan those lasers across um, the, the surface of the body, I can construct a, an image that is analogous, not yet at the same quality, but that is analogous to what you could do with a, a non-ambient or a contact sensor put in place. So on the left, what we're looking at is the laser ultrasound image that was acquired at a distance of two meters from the person. And we see the bone boundary, the muscle fascia, the skin boundary, not at the same resolution, um, as what is uh, coming from a commercially available uh, in-contact ultrasound transducer. Okay, so now I um, wanted to highlight two ways that we can think about immersing ourselves in ambient sensing. Right? So we, we highlighted, pointed to cameras being one example, thermal cameras being an example, we're not making contact, we can embed them into the environment. Radar, Wi-Fi, people are doing work in that area. Katie's accelerating what we can do by the, the mechanical interaction with the floor, 
and, and Sean is celebrating, accelerating what we can do. Um, maybe not in the home yet with lasers uh, imaging you around your, your living spaces, but certainly some applications in the, in the clinical environment of the future. Okay, with that, um, here's your final test, uh, and then I'll turn it over to some questions. Back to, back to interacting with motion. May still be hard to figure out what's going on. Not everybody can do this activity, so I, I give I give kudos to to Praneet. That was that was take number four or five. I actually think to get it right. So he's pretty tired by the end there. So here we're now seeing the the avatar created uh, from motion tracking, uh, the accelerometer in the middle, the EMG at the top, his muscle activation, uh, doing the clapping push-ups, um, and we'll go to the the next one here, so you can actually. Do it live. Very good. So, thank you, everybody. I'm happy to take questions. I want to thank uh, Katie and Sean and Talis and Praneet and, and everybody here in the Immersion Lab uh, to help put this together and, and celebrating the work that they're doing and advancing. And with that, thank you uh, for immersed in ambient sensing and happy to take uh, questions or, or comments. I have a first question to start you off with, Brian. Please go ahead. Yep. Um, what are some current challenges in realizing the vision of uh, long-term motion quality monitoring, quality of motion monitoring, if you will, in the home? In the home? Yeah, so, I mean, the you you cannot get the level of quality in the home unless uh, that we can get here in the immersion lab or other facilities. Um, and But the trade-off is that if I have it in the home, I can get a little, I can trade off a little less quality mm -hmm. with sort of increased number of measurements. So I can, right. I can play sort of the instrumentation game mm -hmm. and, and decrease my noise with having multiple measurements. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really trying to understand the trade off, how, how we can do that. We're, we don't want to imagine a, a, a situation where you have expensive complex sensors that are required. Mm -hmm. What can we do with commercial off the shelf sensors in the home, but you need to figure out more intelligent ways to combine that data. Right. And uh, what's a good way of translating and scaling this, uh, some of the sensors that we want to deploy? Is it partnering with industry or? Yeah, great question. So we do have uh, some of the work, um, the, the work for the floor, for example, um, is, is funded in part uh, by a company called Sexy House, uh, Sexui House, depending on the pronunciation. Um, and they are the largest home builder uh, in Japan. And they're, very interested in adding services to their home. So after they build the home, how do they, what's the, what are the right set of sensors, whether they be radar sensors in the walls and ceilings or sensors on the floor? Um, how do you construct now building material that has natural intelligence in, in this type of sensory functionality built in? So that's one methodology where they're very, in, they're, they're very focused on helping to translate these things into their commercial pipelines. Uh, and then the other natural methodology that is very rampant at MIT is, is this, the individuals that are doing this work, starting companies that start translating it out. And uh, that has not yet been done with the uh, with, with these technologies. Yeah. Uh, certainly opportunity to do so. Yeah. Uh, do you think there will be any privacy concerns? Yeah, great, great question. So one of the reasons that, um, at least from a, a privacy perspective, some of the measures of, of gait and motion you could certainly get with cameras, you know, the cameras of the sort that you're getting from your cell phones, you know, they're, they're at price points where you could indeed imagine putting them into your home. And, but the, the hesitancy there is very much the privacy concern. Now you have a camera streaming data live, potentially, if that's breached or hacked. Mm -hmm. um, so something like the accelerometers is say, well, okay, if that's breached or hacked, that's still a problem. It's still revealing information of the individual, but I'm not capturing all the other things that a camera could capture. So that's one of the reasons that um, so it, there's a, uh, a, a preference for some of these simple things that, that just give a very narrow band of information um, that doesn't reveal uh, any privacy information if it were to be revealed as opposed to a, a camera solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some, what's the best case scenario of uh, deploying ambient sensors? What do you expect 
the how do you expect the world to change or healthcare to change mm -hmm. once ambient sensors are deployed out in the world? Yeah, that's a challenging, interesting and challenging question. And I guess I would sort of just reflect a little bit. Um, maybe the trajectory, what which, which we're still on, <clears throat> but the trajectory of, of wearable sensors. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, there were many of us that were very excited by what you could get with your wearable sensors. And I can, I can measure my heart rate and over time I could track it. And if I'm, a, if I'm a gear head and I love data and numbers, I can go to my doctor and say, hey doc, look, my, my heart rate's doing this. But the doctor 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it's like, I have no idea what that means. I don't know how to deal with it. Great, you collected it. Very rarely would you have the doctor say, okay, that was valuable information. Mm -hmm. Um, that's changing, certainly partially because of the pandemic and the, 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 the ability to use sort of sensors that are the individual's use in the home, for like pulse ox. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a generational change and a maturity change in the, 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 the robustness of the technology. Um, so there's a, 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 a changing recognition that Apple Watch, Garmin, Fitbit, you know, there is some valuable health information there that at least the individual can use and increasingly in, at least in my experience, I'm seeing caregivers mm -hmm. more and more using that data in some very traditional ways, but also some non-traditional ways. So there's some, there's going to be a, a, a big time between now and if we wanted to really use um, things like measures of gait, we're at the very early stages of being able to get that into the home. And how, how we do that technologically, how we re expose that and reveal that to the, cl the clinician that cares about that, Mm -hmm. Those are sort of ecosystem things that need to be figured out. Um, so there's there's a ten year journey right. uh, to to right. figure out how to do that. But we're building on the similar experience of maybe having done that with wearables in, a, in right. an interesting way. Uh, and maybe final question mm -hmm. from me: uh, Do you think uh, there is room for sort of a monitoring cafe model? By that I mean, uh, they, now we are wearing wearables. Obviously, they don't give us high resolution, and ambient sensors are also low resolution. And you said the lab provides high resolution, high quality data. Would there be any benefit in uh, trying to install ambient sensors in more controlled environments, like fitness centers, dance studios, yeah. whatever? Yeah. It may be? No, yeah. great point. And so the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, environments where you have a little bit more control of the environment, so you have a little less ambiguity of how you interpret the sensors or interpret the data. Another area um, that I didn't talk about that is sort of a natural space is the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, there's some interesting opportunities for um, either motion or just vital signs uh, on the factory line or people that are doing manual work, whether they be a dancer mm -hmm. you know, that, are, that are doing manual work for the job or somebody that's doing assembly. Right. Um, so those types of environments are also you know, I think at an early point, but that are concerned with ergonomics and wellness mm -hmm. of the of the people that are doing manual tasks. Right. Um, right. Where these types of measures could be interesting. I think there's an interesting opportunity there as well. Nice. So yeah. these types of things could bring together to, and give personalized and individual feedback with minimal effort. That's right. very exciting. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay. So I think. I, uh, oh, please, there. Go ahead. There's a question. Yeah, this is Joy Deep. So we already have ambient technology uh, in place where it is used the CCTV cameras for, you know, especially in the security uh, space like perimeter breach or tailgating. And um, can we not use the existing, uh, you know, cameras that we have and take it beyond um, what detecting in anomaly in walking and whatnot? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't mean at all to say that we shouldn't use when we have situations where there are cameras or that cameras can be uh, safely and, and privacy preserving in, in a way that's deployed and used. Um, so yes, I mean, there are privacy concerns or sort of uh, security concerns. Um, in any of these, I look maybe very similar to what Praneeth was maybe suggesting a little bit. It, it's not a it's this way. Or, and no other way. It's a combination of what you can get from cameras when you have cameras, what you can get from radar or <laughs> Wi-Fi to monitor gate when you have that, and what you can get with what you have in the floor sensors. So I think it is a, it's a, it's a cafe. It's a, it's a, it's the expanse of different techniques that can work, you know, where each one may be good for one thing, or maybe in working together, you get even more robust, valuable information. So absolutely, I don't want to say that you can't use cameras uh, when they're available, um, but uh, I think it's one of a, a, a multi-sensor, uh, multimodal uh, methodology, um, if we really think that we can get these, these really interesting vital signals and, and things that, that, we, that indicate your health and wellness 
in a way that doesn't require you to comply with remembering to wear your, wear your device. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, uh, so the, uh, the laser uh, ultrasound, is it same as the LiDAR technology or different? It's, it's different. Um, so LiDAR, you're just doing ranging um, and you're just saying how far away is something. And in some sense, when you're doing uh, interferometry, that's very similar. Um, you're measuring the, dis the changing distance between the sensor and the object. Uh, but the added layer is, you know, you can't get a, what you don't, um, there's no natural sound uh, of the ultrasound wavelengths uh, being generated in the body. So you need to use a pulsed laser to generate the sound that then makes the body vibrate, if you will, from the sound bouncing into it and coming back and hitting the surface. And in some ways that, that detection of the motion is partially similar to what you would get with LiDAR, but yeah, different frequencies uh, and different, different requirements on the sensitivity and resolution. Thank you. So I think with that, um, we're at the, the, the five minute time. Um, so I, I thank you everybody for your questions uh, and for your attendance. Um, you know, feel free to reach out. I, I guess I don't have the, the, um, the, the email here. If you wanna reach out to the Immersion Lab, it's Immersion. It's in the chat, okay, see, see it in the chat. Um, in early December, we'll have the next Immerse series. It'll be a, a musical activity um, and um, stay tuned for the announcement. And again, thank you everybody for your, your time today and, and be well and stay safe. So thank you.